Hey, everybody. Today is Monday, September 12th, 2022. Coming up on the show today, from 13 Lives, editor James D. Wilcox. You know that's one of the major challenges. People know the outcome. How do you get them there? What do they learn along the way? How do you entertain them along the way? It was difficult. It kept me up at night. I'm not going to lie. I, I, I worried, like, how am I going to do this? You know, there's certain things you know when you're getting a lot of coverage, and I had a lot of coverage. Yes, all that and a lot more on this edition of The Rough Cut. Well, hey there, my friends. Good to see you again. I missed you last week. It was Labor Day here in the States last Monday, and I didn't feel like doing any labor. So we took a little break. But the podcast is a labor of love, so I am back, and we're back doing, you know, what we love, which is talking with the most amazing post-production people working today. And we are back in a big way with editor James, that's big game James Wilcox. I love talking to James. He's a great guy and a terrific interview, and you're going to have fun with this one. I promise. James is on to talk with us about his new film with director Ron Howard, 13 Lives. 13 Lives is a gripping, yes, I said gripping, account of a young Thai football team, or soccer if you're so inclined, that spent two weeks trapped inside an enormous complex of caves when the monsoon rains came in early and forced those kids, well, it's actually 12 kids and their young assistant coach, to retreat over a mile and a half into the cave. And even for an experienced diver with proper equipment, that is a seven-hour underwater journey in murky waters where you can barely see in front of your face. On top of that, it was a treacherous route that most times forced those divers to squeeze themselves into these tiny little passageways that could barely accommodate them and their air tanks. It's an incredible story. I'm sure a lot of you probably remember this story back in 2018. Spoiler alert, the team was rescued. Most people know that. So how do you make a movie with all the requisite drama and tension when the outcome is already known? Well, I'm sure it helps to work with Apollo 13 director Ron Howard, who already knows a thing or two about that. And James knows a thing or two as well. In fact, probably a lot more than two, all of which we will get to in a moment. First, I do have something else to discuss with you before we get to our requisite shout-out to Rough Cut sponsor, Extreme Music. And I'm talking about it with you now because I know a lot of you tune out as soon as the music comes up at the end. You thought I didn't know that. But you should listen all the way to the end because there might be important info in the wrap-up. Or I could say something funny. It could happen. Anyway, earlier this year I mentioned wanting to do some more panel shows that were topic-oriented, not so much tied to a specific movie or show. And people gave me a lot of great ideas which I will do everything I can to make happen. It's a little more challenging to put together an episode with multiple editors who aren't necessarily all promoting the same project, but it'll happen. That said, what has seemed to be on the rise lately is the number of questions I'm getting from aspiring editors or young people entering a career in film and TV with hopes of being a full-time working editor. And when I get those questions, I answer them as best I can by proxy, by distilling all that I've heard in my discussion with editors. But again, that's secondhand info, and it only helps, if at all, that one person. It's much better to share the info with many people, and much better for it to come directly from the pro editors themselves. So, let's try and see how this works. If you're someone who has a question, or even better questions, about the career of editing, about learning, training, unions, edit room politics, general technical questions, workflow process type questions, questions about interviewing and networking, anything that you can think of to help you in your career path, get those questions to me, and if there's a decent response to this effort, I will get together a panel of pro editors and we will discuss these questions. Many of you know that there is a contact feedback form on the Rough Cut website. Please do not judge me on the website. I know it's a bit of a mess, but the contact form works like a charm. You can write a message. You can leave an audio message, which is definitely my preferred method because then I can actually use the audio of your question in the podcast. So this is in your hands. If you want it to happen, you can make it happen, which is also a nice piece of advice about making a career in editing. If you want it to happen, you can make it happen. I think I will put that on a mouse pad and sell it on the Rough Cut merch store that doesn't exist. Fortunately for all of us, what does exist is extreme music. Since 1997, they have given filmmakers and artists like all of you the best in production audio, created by multi-award winning musicians and composers. Great music from names like Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, and if you listen real careful during the interview with James, you might hear him mention how they helped him in the editing room. How can they help you? Well, you just go to ExtremeMusic.com, sign up for a free account, and start your keyword search for any kind of music you need. They have it all. And if not in actuality all, they certainly have a lot. And what tracks they got, you can get in all kinds of shapes and sizes, right down to the stems, or you can even use their reference track feature to give them a track so they can find you one like it. It's fun, it's easy, you can do it all online, or one of their reps can lend a hand from one of their many, many worldwide offices. So the next time you are in the mood to make a TV show or movie, go see our friends at Extreme Music so they can help you sound your very best. 
All right, so looking forward to this one. Great movie, great guy. From Ron Howard's new film, 13 Lives, here is James Wilcox. But we're not here to talk about football. We are here to talk about 13 Lives, which I'm very excited to talk about because I enjoyed it quite a bit. If you can think back this far, try and pick up where we left off two years ago with Hillbilly Elegy, I think that was both your first feature with Ron Howard and I think your first big feature. Am I mistaken or is that? It was. It was. It was both. Yeah, that was my first big feature and my first big feature with Ron. Okay. So at what point did he approach you about 13 Lives and what did he say to you about it? You know, it's funny. We uh, were finishing up. Well, the, the funny thing about both of these movies, I was in New York when the pandemic hit. So I was working from my apartment, could no longer go into the offices. And somewhere in the middle of doing ADR, he asked me to read the script for 13 Lives. And I had so much work to do. And I told him, Ron, I'll, I'm happy to look at it. I'm excited to look at it. But I probably can't get to it for a solid week. I'm just being honest with you. Because I don't like reading scripts in bits. I want to sit down, start to finish. And actually, before I can even respond, go through it a couple of times. Because I know there's going to be questions about different areas of the script that may need work or what's working well or the challenges that I see from a cutting standpoint, or even from a shooting or logistics or just the audience, what are they expecting? What are the big story moments? Whatever these things are. So I, I, I read the script like a week afterwards and then I was blown away because the script was so good in such good shape to start with. And the movie felt like it had similar DNA to Apollo 13. And Ron is the right guy for both of those movies, those biopics yeah. where people are trying to do things against insurmountable odds. And, uh, and from there, we had some subsequent conversations after I came back to L.A. and finished up Hillbilly Elegy. And then I did a project for them. I did Genius Aretha, a couple of episodes for them. I was going to take the time off. And 13 Lives was kind of coming along a little slower. So uh, I had to get back to work. And then uh, before I knew it, I was on a plane to London going over there to cut 13 lives in their pandemic lockdown. Well, I think that says a lot about your comfort level. You would say to Ron Howard, hey, not now with your script. I'm busy. <laughs> That's, <laughs> I'm busy with your other work. <laughs> I'm busy with your other movie. Well, so, OK, you mentioned Genius. I think that was the project that that Nat Geo series. That's where you first started working together. And then Hillbilly Elegy came along during that time. And then you did Aretha after that. Suffice to say, you and Ron have worked together for a little while now and got to know each other pretty well. How would you say your working relationship has evolved since you first met him and started working with him? That's a great question, because I've oftentimes wondered that from the very first time that we started working together all the way up to 13 Lives. And I can tell you, our collaboration has done nothing but gotten better, more shorthand on an instinctual level. Just the collaboration has widened. When I first started with Ron, like many people, I just had such profound respect for him. And I was still doing my thing on Genius Einstein that first season. And that's where he was giving me a lot of positive feedback. And then eventually that rolled into uh, Hillbilly Elegy. Because with these biopics and the people in them still alive and authenticity being like paramount to everything that you're doing, I'm from Western Pennsylvania. And so for Hillbilly Elegy, that was down in that region, the Appalachian region, West Virginia. Kentucky, Ohio. And so I said, listen, I don't know this family, of course, but I know these folks. These folks are not far from the way I grew up, the people I've seen. I can tell you various things that you'll want to pick up when you're shooting that give the region its authenticity. And he listened. He did. I gave him a whole big shot list of you'll want to get this, 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 this. And that was based on also some research that I had done with people that I've talked to because I haven't been lived back there in a while. So things change. And then from there, with 13 Lives, you know, it's interesting, Matt, because the reviews for Hillbilly Elegy, we've never seen a review split so diametrically opposed like that before, where the audiences were like, we really dig this movie and we can relate to it. And the critics were like, we're just not feeling it at all. And a number of factors I could go into why I think that ultimately happened. It was the time of the release. It was still a pandemic, you know, presidential elections, J.D. Vance, his politics. The book was controversial in, an own, in its own right. So there was so many, so many things going on. But ultimately, once I heard that those reviews and I thought, OK, well, that's not going to happen again with 13 lives. I'm going to speak up more. 
I'm going to use more of my instincts. I'm going to just play a greater role in what those criticisms potentially could be in shielding them off. So on this movie, with Ron being in Australia shooting, primarily principal photography, I was in London and we had a line of communications that was just really great. And we mostly connected on weekends. And I thought it was really important that we carry that dialogue because, you know, there's certain things, you know, when you're getting a lot of coverage and I had a lot of coverage there and happy about it too, because it's one of the benefits when you start repiping the story in certain areas, you can elegantly make those changes. But there were certain things in the underwater photography where I was like, I don't think we have it, Ron. And I want to show you these scenes just so you don't come back to London. I haven't spoken up and said when we had the chance before the set was struck, we could have gone in, reshot this, or actually spurred a new idea of how we could better execute this. So on a sixth day, he would go over to second unit and shoot all the dive photography stuff that second unit was getting and sometimes not getting. And as the story evolved, we just had a better idea of the details we needed. So that was one of those key areas where our collaboration and communication really expand it for the best. Something else you brought up along the way was research and also understanding the material that you're working with. Do you take it upon yourself to, you know, we all lived through this event that took place in 2018, but just picking up bits and pieces through the news. Do you go out and research this event more to find out everything you can about the people involved, the way it went down? Yeah, absolutely. With this being a true story that we're really trying to trace what those big moments were in the story, the unraveling of it. And Ron calls it always what we were trying to approach was the anatomy of a miracle. So I looked at this odd thing, you know, these these UK divers and the team, they have that odd hobby of going into caves. Sometimes it's to pull bodies out. Sometimes it's rescue missions. And it's just this hobby that they've uh, developed over the years and they, over 30 years, really. Um, so I looked at a lot of footage of what's called sump diving, which is basically diving in zero visibility environments in caves. And anytime you move, the silt kicks up, lessens your visibility even more. It's incredibly dangerous. And so I looked at a lot of that footage. I looked at the interviews from the people who were involved that were integral to our story. I looked at the parents' reactions during the time when they were just kind of having to sit, wait and suffer the outcome. There was a thing called Drain the Oceans that was on Nat Geo that kind of chronicled the story. And I even looked at, there was another movie that was made initially. So there's been three films that have approached this subject, 13 Lives. Then there was The Rescue, the documentary. And before that, there was another movie that was made initially called The Cave. And I looked at that because I was just trying to figure out like how they approached it. And if there was anything in that, that would be a benefit to us that wasn't in the script. So I do a lot of research. Um, I tried to hire as many people as I could of Thai descent in post-production, but I couldn't find anyone outside of Los Angeles. Initially, we were going to cut Matt in New York. And so I was going to use my hillbilly allergy team. And I said, one of the things we got to do is for cultural reasons, for the language of it all, I want you guys to find someone who's of Thai descent, English speaking Thai descent, who speaks Thai as well, who we can bring on staff. Even if it's a PA, they'll be of great value to us, a great resource. And once the movie kind of shifted to London, that went out of the way. And I wasn't even successful with that either in New York. So then I told the same thing to my staff in London and they were already a ready-made team because they had worked with Ron before. And we tried to find a PA of sorts that was of Thai descent and we just couldn't. So we just set on this journey ourselves with the research that I had in mind and, and the knowledge that I had about the story and just began to go to work. I definitely want to get back to you vocalizing your opinions and your concerns more this second time out. When you eventually got around to reading the script, when you got back to Mr. Howard said, OK, I'll read your script now. It wasn't quite like that, Matt. <laughs> it's a great visual. Um, anything that stood out to you as this is going to be a challenge from a storytelling perspective? I mean, the event takes place over two weeks. The process is a long, arduous, you know, for a diver to get into where the kids were at seven hours. There's just so much storytelling that has to be compacted into what still was a two and a half hour movie, although it moves very well. Anything from that initial script reading where you made notes and, and said to Ron, OK, I want to keep an eye on this or I'm concerned about that? Yeah, there were lots of things and lots of things that manifested itself in the final cut of the movie. First off, what kept me up at night, the Thai language. 
how am I going to cut a movie in Thai? I talked to so many editors who had cut foreign language films, and none of them have a really, really concise answer on how to do it. So there was that. Then there's 13, well, 12 kids and their coach. And I'm thinking the level of acting that we're going to need from 12 kids, you'd be lucky. I thought we'd be lucky if we had three of them out of the 12 that were really good. And then distinguishing the boys along the way, because it's not like in the Thai culture, one of them was blonde and the other one was a redhead and a thing like that. They're all fairly dark haired kids from the north. And so how are we going to separate them out? in terms of their jerseys that they're wearing, their football jerseys that they're wearing. So we ended up, Ron was very smart about this. The main kids that we relied on, the tallest kid who spoke English, the team captain. Then there was the smallest kid who we couldn't find, a, who they couldn't find a mask to fit him. And then there was the birthday boy. And those were primarily the three kids that we targeted. And they were all well prepared, all 12 of the kids. Our Thai producers did a fantastic job getting those kids ready. Their attention never waned. They seemed to understand the circumstance that they were in any any time we shot whatever scene. And people think sometimes, I, I think the layperson thinks that we shoot these movies in continuity. So you would have an understanding of where you've been and where you're going. For instance, we shot the finding of the boys was the first scene that I, I cut. I go, oh, okay, we're jumping in like that. We're going to cut the biggest, one of the biggest scenes first. But there were all these other things like just cave geography, identification underwater, you know, and not just with the kids, but with Vigo and Colin and Joel and Paul Gleason and all the other divers. How are we going to really be able to understand who's who? Because if you ever get lost, you're behind now and you're spinning to catch up. And just the underwater photography itself, you can't speed it up. You can't put any motion effects on it. You'll see it right away. Immediately, I was asking for, because we shot with doubles at times. We didn't always have the principles. I was asking, could we do face replacements? And that proved to be impossible to do that because to line that up one to one, you just would never have any success with that. Even things like, can I get water removed? There's a take I like. Can I get water removed from the mask? Can't do that either. So what that ended up doing was forcing Vigo, forcing Colin and all the guys to do their own stunts with the real kids. So there were a number of script concerns that I had. And then overall, it was a, it was a long script with a lot in it. So just tracking all of that was quite a big deal. And then one of the obvious things is how do we keep people at bay from calling this a white savior movie? How do we really build up the Thai efforts? How do we show all the volunteerism? How do we keep the storylines going from what's happening on the mountain with the water flooding in from the top? So there was a lot there. But eventually I just said, you know what, just take it scene by scene because it's so easy to get ahead of yourself with all the ideas and the challenges that are present. And that's what I did. I just, you know, as the material came in, I just go, just James is still only one scene at a time, no matter what. It seems in more recent years, Ron gravitates to documentaries, done a lot of documentaries, and stories about real people and real events. Again, probably most famously, Apollo 13. And the challenge therein, I would think, would be these are stories that have been told because they're real. Everybody knows the kids got out alive. So how do you create drama and tension when the outcome is already known? I think it goes back to the script to start with, Matt. First off, yes. So you know that's one of the major challenges. People know the outcome. How do you get them there? What do they learn along the way? How do you entertain them along the way? We knew we wanted to make a film that hit our central nervous system, that hit our hearts. And like we learned something along the way. And the big reveal in the movie, of course, is how they get the kids out. The more people who, who respond to me about the movie and how impressed they were with it, continuously, almost to a person say, I had no idea they had to drug the kids to get them out. I didn't know. And the reason you didn't know, along with everyone else, is that scene in the movie where they sent the press away and the governor says, nobody can know about this, even the parents. So no one had knowledge of it. So that is the big reveal. And I thought, OK, so the first thing is we'll make finding the kids a big deal because that'll feel good in the movie. So we know that happened. The next thing will be, OK, now that we've found them, the stakes are higher. So how are we going to get them out? And you see all the anxiety from the main two guys, especially from Rick Stanton, his fear of, I don't want to be photographed. 
carrying dead bodies, dead children out of this cave. And then on top of that, there's all the Thai politics that come into play. If this doesn't work out, who gets blamed for it? So there's many, many things that we dove into that just are dramatically compelling story points. You know, the parents not being told anything. You can't imagine the agonizing suffering that they're going through. So all of that has really a lot of emotional weight attached to it. And then once I got my initial cut laid out, it was very long. I'll tell you right now, my cut was close to five hours. And we were still expecting footage from Thailand to come in to augment a lot of the stuff that we didn't have because they had an outbreak in Thailand, a COVID outbreak, and we couldn't go there immediately as the schedule was planned for. So back to your initial question, how do you keep that going? There's so much to learn in the movie that's fascinating. And then there's so many moments of high drama, high stakes as to getting these kids out. Will they all make it? And in my mind, I thought I'd never want the audience to feel any sense of guaranteed safety or assurances that those kids are all going to be brought out. Because while it is miraculous that one was brought out, 13 people have to be brought out, including the divers who went in after them. And unfortunately, one of the volunteer divers, two of them actually lost their lives in an attempt to help rescue them. So there was all these dramatic moments in the script. Saman's death was like breathtaking. And all we had to do once we got my cut down and kept refining it and kept eliminating redundancies and allowing the audience to go, okay, they understand the length that it takes to get in there, the difficulty, the obstacles. They understand certain familiar signposts in the tunnel as to where they meet, where they plan, how the mission is unfolding. You didn't need to show that again. So it gave us an accelerated pace of not having anything redundantly displayed. So you being in London, there in Australia, and Ron's pretty much only communicating with you, it sounds like on the weekends, what's the dailies process like for you? And, and how are you working with your assistants in that remote workflow? Well, the dailies are coming in, being processed in Australia, coming in high fiber lines into London. And then my assistant, my lead, who's an organizational genius, Simon Davis, he just did a phenomenal job. And when I first met them all, this was our first time working together. I told him, look, everybody here has a part in the storytelling. So as you're looking at dailies, as you're organizing them, I want you to look for moments that I may have missed because it's a lot coming in. So I would need you to be a valuable part of the team. So when you see my cut, if you think there's a better moment or something that I've missed, feel free to speak up. And in terms of dailies coming in, we had 382 hours. So it was quite a lot to tackle there. And then along with script sync on certain scenes that could be played a number of different ways. And the dailies workflow, there were days where we had upwards of 12 hours of footage coming in. And that's my whole shift. If I did nothing else, <laughs> if I just looked at dailies and went for lunch and came back the next day, I'd still be watching. So quite a challenge there to get all that footage ingested and uh, begin to work on it. Starting the movie, it's always challenging. And one decision is how much time do we take to get to know these kids before they're trapped in the cave? And the film wastes no time getting to it. Within 10 minutes, we see the kids playing soccer. We find out one of them's having a birthday. Before the birthday, they go to the cave. The rains come in, and the next thing you know, they're stuck, and the parents are like, how do we get our kids out of there? So tell me about crafting that opening and how you refined it to the version that's in the film. The opening is fairly close to the script, immediately establishing the kids as a football team and who's in charge with the coach and the birthday event. And that this was just a normal day in the life after football practice. And it was the kid's birthday and they decided to go to the cave, have a little time before it was time to go to the party. One of the kids didn't go, which is how the parents were notified where the kids went to the cave. And from that point on, the kids go in the monsoons come early. We don't see them anymore. That was another great point, I thought, in the movie because people were asking us, should we show the water raging in to the cave? And Ron never shot it that way. And he decided, no, the suspense of wondering what is going on with the children, I thought dramatically was brilliant because I thought, and we all did, you know, when we read the script, if you see the kids back there, there's going to be a little less worry and dramatically like not seeing them, it just builds up this idea in their mind. What are they going through? 
It's 10 days before they were discovered. No food, only water that's trickling down from inside the mountain that they're drinking. Um, you can go longer without food than you can without water. So it really just heightened everything. And then it was one brilliant note that one of our producers, Karen Lunder, gave us. She asked us to try a version where we remove the main title up front. And you know, it thrust us right into this timeline of no breaks. So they go in, they're stuck in the cave. Now all of a sudden, here comes one of the kid's mom, Chai, the smallest kid's mom. She's riding on a scooter through town and she arrives at the party and they're all like, okay, so where are the kids at? And of course, the boy who didn't go says, well, they went to the cave and, you know, as parents do, that was stupid. What they go to the cave for in this rain? <laughs> he tells them it wasn't raining when it happened. So now off to the cave they are. And it just put us right in the mix without really ever stopping down to say we're a movie. And why that was important is because in the DNA structure of the whole movie, we really wanted it to feel very documentary-like. And I personally wanted it to feel very subjective because of the number of times that the divers go into, and that's all the divers, the Navy SEALs, the UK dive team, the people that were working on pumps around there, the number of times in and out of that cave, I needed it to feel subjective so that everyone had their own personal challenge to what it was gonna be like to get those kids out. So if you really go and look at the movie, there's not an identical setup where you go, oh yeah, that's how they travel in. Like the idea is yes, Ron brilliantly said, we will travel the guys in from right to left, they will exit the tunnel left to right. And that holds pretty much true in principle, except for when the camera is center punched and they're coming towards us or I drop back behind them and you see them go through some pivot point into some narrow crawl space to go on the other side. But that helped with the geography along with ultimately the graphics and everything else. Well, let's talk about the graphic as, as you said, orientating the audience, giving them a sense of where they are or where the divers are in relation to the kids. It's underwater. It's practically pitch black. It's a shot of a diver underwater squeezing through rocks. There's no distinguishing characteristics, really. You're not going to say, oh, I remember that stalactite from the previous scene. So you have this really cool, very effective graphic, a schematic of the cave. I'd like to know where that framework came into the process. Is it in the script saying this is where they are? That's a really important mechanism that you're using to, to make this story work. The days were in the script, but it was never indicated that we should graphically display what day it is or the cave geography from a map overlay. And the time it took, elapsed time it took to get in and get out. And it was just one of those things that it was better to just show and not tell because it's quite effective in the quiet places where you see, oh, okay, well, this is where the Thai Navy SEALs started. This is how far they got. They tied off a red guideline. Then when the UK dive team went in, they picked up where those guys left off and used a blue tie line to get further into the cave. And that becomes the guideline that they use to get themselves in and out and to pull the kids out as well. So Ron and I came up with the idea and I really was at a certain point when we were cutting down the movie, it was clear that it was going to be a little bit more of a journalistic approach. And I thought, well, you know what? We need to reinforce to the audience the distance that these kids are back there because they're basically a mile and a half back. And you know, if you ask the average person, could you run a mile and a half right now, just straight off in your street clothes, in jogging shorts, whatever, are you prepared to run a mile and a half? And then you start thinking about it, you go, hold up, these kids are that far back and it's not a straight shot to get them. There's so many different chambers that have different geography and getting them and the time it took. And then there were times where I just didn't use the map, but I would cut back to one of the aerials from Thailand to just show you just swimming in the belly of that mountain. And so, yeah, uh, it, it, it proved to be very effective to have the audience just going. It's the ticking clock of it all is what it really equates to. And there's a subtle thing that we did from day one when we first established them on the soccer field, all the way up to the last day, day 18, the title gradually has grown closer to, not full screen, but it's emphasized larger so you can see the weight of, wow, this has taken 18 days to get them in and out of this tunnel. 
So yeah, I thought everybody seemed to respond well to it. And uh, it just became another character in the movie. One thing I, I thought I noticed, you can tell me if this was something that you really had the intent behind was you have the graphic of the cave, then you also have below it divers seven hours away from, or how many hours away from this point. And the graphic would fade out first, but then the, the time would still hold for a little bit and fade out. So you really made sure that the audience, no pun intended, clocked that part of it. And I just wondered if, what kind of discussions you had about that or the thinking behind that. Part of it was rhythm because I didn't want everything to go away in the same shot. And I wanted to have a double emphasis. One of them was location. The other one was time to get in and out of there. And that was important because, you know, as they said in the movie, the UK divers, when they were talking to the SEALs, look, going in there, I know you guys are good, but this is not going to be easy. You've got to conserve a third of your air to get in and get back out. It's a tough physical dive. So it's going to take longer than you guys think. And we needed to start building that idea up in layers. It didn't always have to be that the shot held as a backplate for the geography. And then once we cut that, I didn't necessarily want to get out of the, the elapsed time. I wanted that to linger more. So you just remembered, because a movie like this, I think it's easy to overwhelm the audience with so much reading, the subtitles, all the foreign language reports that are going on. Then there's the continuous thread of the World Cup happening. So you kind of needed to just slow it down for the audience a little bit so that they could appreciate all the different things that went into the timing, the distance, the geography, where they stopped, where they started, where they were trying to get to. It just, I think it just played a little better, better rhythmically to just not have everything pop on, pop off, same time. Did you have a map yourself or were you often referencing your own map of like, this is where we are in the story and this is where the diver should be at this point and any sort of tools you use to help keep you situated properly as the editor? Absolutely. We basically turned my cutting room into a uh, war room 2.0. So on one side of the cutting room walls were all the typical frame grabs of every scene. So we could look at if we move this scene, if we lose this scene, what does that do to what's behind us? What does that do to where we just came from? But in terms of like cave geography and schematics and who carried which boys out on which day, that was hard for us to understand that because these are all Thai kids, their names are all different, um, and who brought whom out on which day and where they were. And so we had uh, a, a diagram. So James is now holding up a diagram for me. <laughs> You'll have to send this to me, James. <laughs> I will. I wanted you to see this. But this is reflective of a board that we had of all the children's names, all the um, locations where they were handed off to another diver, who that diver was that brought them out. And that kind of helped us initially sort out um, everything, geography, the kids, where they were supposed to go when they were brought out, all the various medical stations and what happened once they were brought out. So we couldn't have done it without that. With the underwater footage, did you find that you had less material to work with just because how arduous it was for them to shoot that stuff? No, actually, you know what? That ended up being the most voluminous part of the shoot, the underwater footage, because as I said, you couldn't speed it up. So it effectively acted almost as 48 frames. So, you know, if you speed it up, the water's going to look funny. It's going to look sped up, the whole thing. So we couldn't do that. And then there were days where we shot with the photo doubles of the principals and the real child. Then there were days we shot with the photo doubles of the children and the principals until finally we arrived at with the limitations of what we could do underwater. On those six and seven days, Colin Vigo, Paul Gleason, Joel Edgerton, all those guys, Bateman and those guys would go over to the sets on the second unit and shoot their own stunts. And they initially did not think that they were going to be doing their own stunts. That was Vigo Mortensen, who had trained as a diver, um, gotten certified, then 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 Colin did the same thing. And and Joel and 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 Vigo went to Ron and said, Ron, you have to let me do my own stunts. And I don't think it was an easy decision because that meant rejiggering the schedule. You know, there were days when those guys were out at the base camp or in that changing room shooting other scenes or what have you. And then they'd have to go over to another set 
on a sixth or seventh day to film their own stunts. So at least 80% of what you see in the movie is, is really them doing their own stunts. And in terms of sending shots and, and scenes back to Ron, this was the thing that I was telling him about that without seeing Vigo and identifying him so the audience doesn't get lost or Colin or any of the other divers at a critical moment, it's a cheat and it's looking like a cheat. And, and I don't think we're not going to be able to manufacture this when we get back, when you come back for your director's cut. So he saw it. He understood what I was talking about. He had similar concerns and I would just send him the scenes and go, take a look. I wouldn't even preface it with, here's my concerns. I just want to hear what he thinks, because maybe in there, he has an idea of something I haven't thought of that may, may very well work that we can later on manufacture in the cutting room. But highly doubt we could do that because we needed to see the faces. And those divers were only really distinguishable by seeing their faces. And it's an odd thing that happens underwater and you get your face squeezed in that face mask. Everybody's face is just squished up. And the only thing after a while, I think you could see that Vigo's helmet was like an orange and Collins was like a white, but then Joel had Joel had a white one too, and one had stripes on and the other one didn't. And I couldn't rely on helmet identification underwater. <laughs> no, that's too much to ask the audience to flow with. We had to really see the divers' faces. Okay, so you can't really manufacture stuff after the fact. You can, but it's going to be really challenging and it probably won't work the way you want it to. But were there benefits to that kind of footage in that you could steal shots between scenes? Yeah, you could move footage around once you establish the initial entrance into the tunnel from chamber, well, the mouth of the tunnel into chamber three and ultimately back to chamber nine. And that was one of the things in our screenings. We had three screenings in London and two here. And that was one of the things that we quickly uh, found out that the audience was very much following where they were, who was who, um, and the geography was all set. So then we didn't need to, as the movie went on and on, we didn't need to show exactly the same dive time. We could make cuts to go, okay, so now we brought on two new divers. What does it look like for them to see these boys skinny back in the dark for the first time? So it became a very subjective storytelling each time we went in there. And then also we learned that we could truncate it. You know, we really didn't need, we could just show it and cut to like, okay, now they brought food in. Do we really need to see them go through all the same motions that it took to get them in there? Now we need to get to them getting the food because we want to be back with the boys as much as possible. So once we establish the geography, yes, we could steal shots here or there uh, to help us make our points. In a situation like this, when there's a race against time, a lot of filmmakers will use a, if not literally a clock, some sort of mechanism to say, oh, we have two hours and 22 minutes before the bomb goes off or whatever. And you don't do that here, not in an overt way. So I want to ask you about any discussions or thoughts you had in the editing room about some sort of clock methodology. I know, you know, at one point you added a radio voiceover. There's a news reporter talking about rising CO2 levels in the cave. So you do start to creep in little tidbits about like, there is a clock here, it's unseen, and it's not exactly super precise, but we have these meters showing how much oxygen is left or how much CO2 is in the cave. There's another rainstorm coming and will overwhelm the space that they're in. So that's a very long question and a lot of talking by me just to try and get to the clock element and how you used or didn't use it. That device with the outside reporters is pretty much from real newscast. And each separate day on the last three days, day 16, 17, and 18, that became really vital because you began to understand how the story was being covered and that what the impending challenges were the weather by day 18, the fatigue on the divers. They had gone in for two days in a row and done this whole dive back and forth. And you just can't imagine the mental strain and the physical toll that it was taking on them. And then, of course, you know, when you're hearing the reports by day 18 that the monsoons are coming and they're coming fast and that there's one point in there where a reporter says that um, they're at war. With the, with the weather, they're at war with the water. So you know if they don't get in and get those kids out within the next two days or so, the cave's gonna flood and nobody's gonna survive it. So those reports were really, really critical in like timestamping what was going on, as well as we used this, the thread for the World Cup. 
you know, to, to remind people what else was going on in the world at that time. So yes, it's not a device that we use in a literal sense in terms of score or some tone underneath where you heard a ticking clock. I think the score ended up being very, um, anxiety provoking in a lot of sections, but, um, it really was just the idea that, uh, there's an urgency to this because these kids have been in there for a long time. And that's just, that be, creates its own sense of urgency, I would think, um, and anxiety. And then the news reports to help support that. And of course, you know, the story itself is we got to get these kids out of here because they had no other options. At one point, we did have a scene um, amongst the governor and the divers where they were discussing all the options, but um, none of the options really were None of them would have worked. It was this ingenious plan that Rick Stanton came in, came up with. And when he brought Dr. Harry in, that's the only thing, obviously, you know, that they thought was had a chance to be successful, you know. And then also you have the parents who are growing impatient. So there were a lot of built in story points that just helped reinforce. We got to get these kids out of here, you know the mental strain on the kids and and how they're going to behave. Thank God they had that coach that was uh, a previously a Buddhist monk trained and helped them meditate to keep them calm and preserve their energy. You mentioned the score and that creating tension, the sound design. You've got the tanks scraping against the caves, the breathing apparatus, the bubbles, the sound of the rope. It's funny how those things without dialogue really do create a lot of tension. Initially, when I did my first cut, I tr experimented with, and even before I even got on the Avid, I was listening to track after track after track of what felt more ambient and natural to that world of being underwater and what seemed like it would marry with that if I did use score. And there was very little that in the end kind of worked. A few ambient tracks from like Attempt With from Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross and a few other people that composers that work in that ambient mechanized world of sort of the newer, more modern approach to composing Hilder, Guanadotter, people, composers like that. And so w when we were laying the movie out, we always talked about, we don't want it to feel manipulative and, you know, score can do that. So we just wanted to be restrained. And I talked to our supervising sound editors, Rachel Tate and Oliver Tarney, and they were on board with the same thing because it's a wonderful opportunity to take people on a journey that they will never experience in their lives. How many people ever go in caves in their lives? How many people are going to go underwater in caves and who want to do this? This is exactly the kind of transformative movie where you go, I would never do that in real life, but I will watch this on a screen. So we thought our approach was we spotted everything score wise so that we could have the option. Once you get on the stage, it just kind of can be a little late uh, to st start coming up and writing score and the sessions have already occurred. So now you're just pilfering from what you've already recorded to see if it would work. And initially I talked a lot about just having a subjective feel for the divers. I wanted to know if this was me, what would it sound like? What would it feel like going in there? They couldn't see. I want to see and hear them bang their heads on stalactites. I want to hear them grab that rope and pull themselves along. I want to see the difference and hear the difference of their experience breathing versus the ties accelerated breathing at various points in the story. And so on those initial dives, super important to just sound design it. And that has its own sort of odd rhythm of music and score and everything. And when we presented it to Ron, he just was like, I love it, you know? And so we, so, so now that we have the initial part of it, pretty much sound design, when we're re-entering the cave, now we can start to introduce score because there's certain sticky parts in the cave where it's just flat out dangerous, where the, the one of the rocks gives way and there's like an explosion of, of water underneath. And then the urgency of what happens with up on the mountain that we can use now score to help drive that because we're revisiting those areas of the story, but I don't want them to hear or visually be redundant. Well, James, I don't know how many people would willingly go into a cave before seeing this movie. Now that I have seen it, I will never go into a cave. 
I'm telling you, it's raining outside right now and I'm nervous. So it's, um, <laughs> you know, you brought up something earlier as a challenge. You talked about how most of the film is Thai dialogue and then you quickly brushed away like, but I figured it out. There's got to be a lot to that. I mean, how do you cut a movie that is predominantly in a dialogue that you don't understand? It was difficult. It kept me up at night. I'm not going to lie. I, I, I worried, like, how am I going to do this? Language and culture are very much tied together. So if you get the language wrong, you might be offensive in the culture in some area. And so my, 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 again, my lead, Simon Davis, we both, it was our biggest concern, our biggest area of struggle. So when the daily started coming in, I had a phonetic script breakdown and that's a lot of reading. And I just wanted to just start watching dailies. So he would take every take through Google translator and listen to it and translate the take and then subtitle it on camera because some takes had ad libs to them. Some takes they misspoke. And that was my concern. How do I understand where there's an ad lib going on? Cause I haven't heard these same phrases said over and over enough to recognize the differences. So he gave me everything. Then once I got enough cut, we brought in a translator. And she began to look at scenes. <laughs> and a funny thing occurred with her as she was looking at the scenes. Because you have to understand, Matt, this story is a huge national story in Thailand. And they're very much emotionally affected by it to this day. I mean, it is just an incredible, an incredible story that um, just shook their nation. So she would look at scenes and um, I'd ask Simon after she left, how did we do? And he goes, well, we did good, but I had to kind of run it back for her three, four times because she would get so engrossed in the story. I turn around and ask her how we were doing and she'd be in tears. <laughs> and, and then he would ask her, well, did the governor say this? She goes, yeah, he said that. He goes, are you sure the governor said that? Because on one of the other takes, I thought he said something different. Run it back. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said this or no, no, he didn't say that. He said this. And so she kind of got swept up, which was this wonderful validation that it was going in the right direction. So I never touched their natural pacing, their pauses or anything like that. Now, that's just the initial part of it. So as we started moving scenes around and, and getting rid of scenes like there's a there was a scene initially where after John calls Rick, to say, are you following this story developing in Thailand? Our names are put on a list by Vern. And so are you going to go? That's the gist of that story. And so the answer to that in one scene was they show up at the airport. They have their bags. This is how we know Rick decided he was going to go. And then at the airport was the, was Saman, the diver, retired diver who volunteered and lost his life. And he was seeing them come in and out with scuba gear. And he was looking at a news report on camera from the minister. So that's how we met him. But then we decided, you know, we're going to introduce this guy again to the Navy SEALs when he comes riding through the base camp on the back of that scooter. And so now we need to do ADR. How do we do ADR in another language? It's the first, it's the first project I've ever worked on. I didn't have to put my voice on. So what I did was I, I just on camera, I, I, I subcapped what we wanted him to say. And then I used other parts of his same voice within the scene and just used that as fill as an approximation of, I think this might be how long it takes for him to say, oh, this is Saman. He took vacation. He's one of us. He's a former SEAL. So then, then the rest of the scene I could kind of pick up as it was. But that was, that was tricky. And then within that, within the whole translation of the Thai language, those boys, they're from the north of Thailand. So apparently their dialect is so different that the people from Bangkok aren't exactly sure word for word what they're saying. And there's that wonderful scene in the movie where the mother comes up and she confronts the governor and says, we don't have IDs. And then the governor's assistant tells them they're from Myanmar across the border. So she's concerned that they're gonna get the short shrift and they won't save their kids. So there were all these things that had to go along ultimately to get the dialect and of course the culture right. 
James, forget 13 lives. I can't believe this movie didn't take 13 years. That is, <laughs> I mean, my jaw is still open from you saying that Simon had to Google Translate all the dailies. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll skip the question about what you ask of your assistants, because that probably covers a lot of it. But going back to our talk for Hillbilly Elegy, you know, one of the things we talked about is your early beginnings and how you got your start in television. You didn't really work as an assistant. How do you suppose that informs what you look for in an assistant? In other words, if you didn't go through that traditional process, do you think it might have changed or impacted what you look for in your assistant? Possibly. I think the only thing is understanding what I'm asking of them and the time frame that it takes. Occasionally that creeps up because I didn't have the experience as an assistant. So just like managing my expectations for how long it takes versus how long I think it would take me um, is different. And But I'll say this, where we strike the common ground is I have profound respect for what the assistants do all the infrastructure, all the, the organization that, cause on a movie like this, if we're disorganized, we fall behind, we fall behind. We just, we're sunk. I mean, we just are in deep trouble, but I always tell every assistant, the seconds, the lead, that you are a storyteller. Cause I know somewhere in all of them, they want to be probably transitioning out of the assistant world and into the chair and any little idea that they can give me that makes the movie better. I'm willing to be, to discuss it, to present it, to find it, to look at it. Doesn't mean I always agree with them, but I want to have everybody's full involvement. I don't want people just yes sirring me because look, I got to hear it. That's our first test screening really is what the assistants see and think of it. Um, because if something doesn't work or it's just not good enough, I need to know it at that point. I'm pretty objective myself. But I just want to know, is it only me who's being too hard or too easy with the moment? Um, but what do you guys think? And I've been blessed to have some really sharp and shrewd assistants that once you deputize them, that they have a voice in the story. You know, they're ready to go. They're ready to speak up. And it does nothing but help improve the movie. You mentioned that one of the keys to keeping the audience engrossed in this film is that even though they're aware of the outcome, a big reveal is how it was achieved. And the fact that they had to anesthetize these boys and literally transport them like packages through the water for two to seven hours underwater through a cave. So you're right. There was a big reveal, a big learning moment for the audience. For you as the editor on 13 Lives, what do you take away? What are your big learning moments? I think really it goes back to how we as people, when we shed our differences politically, racially, religious wise, whatever those things that tend to divide us, how amazing we can be. I, I just in awe of this story and the participants, the volunteers of it all, that 5,000 plus people would come from all over the world, including armies and, and all sorts of organizations to come and support the rescue of 13 kids, 13 or 12 kids in their coach. And that is um, something that I think we need more of. We need to hear more stories that reinforce the positive aspects and the profound volunteerism and just, you know, the amazing things that we can do as people, because we get caught up in so many things and we're going through this pandemic and all these other things. And it's a struggle and inflation and you name all the things that can affect one's life. But you see a story like that and it really is life affirming. You just go, wow, um, I can imagine if someone, if that was my child and people came from who knows what parts of the world to just help save my child that they don't even know. And that I found that to be the sacrifice to be just, I, I, I don't even know if I can properly put it into words, what all the people who were involved in that rescue mission were able to do to accomplish the success that they had. Well, you're right. I mean, there are so many times during the film, you learn a lot and this film stays with you after you've seen it. And I enjoyed it immensely. You did a tremendous job. I'm still stuck on the Google Translate thing with the Thai dialogue. That's amazing. <laughs> Uh, but you did an awesome job. I think we've covered everything we could possibly cover. The only thing left I'm curious about is being a Steelers fan, how do you feel about going into the season with Mitch Trubisky as your starter? I like Mitch. He's played well in the preseason. Our offensive line is porous. So he's that mobility that he has, we're going to really put that to the test. <laughs> he's going to be stress tested every game. So I don't know. I wish him well. He seems like a good guy, the right guy to succeed Ben. And if he's not, we've got two other quarterbacks ready to get in there and show what they can do. Ever the optimist. Go Steelers. <laughs> Have to be, right? <laughs> That's right. Whether it's your football team or your new film, you just got to believe. 
And I believe James is a terrific storyteller, not to mention a wonderful interview and a really cool guy. So big thanks to Big Game James for talking with us today. And you should check out 13 Lives and try and wrap your head around the challenge James faced in making that movie all it could be and more. If you would like to be all that you can be as an editor, and possibly a little more, you could do worse than to make Avid Media Composer your trusted ally in the cutting room. It cuts, it trims, and if you talk to it real nice, it'll even do a dissolve. But it'll do much more than that, you know that. But do you know everything it can do? Well, probably not. And that is why you gotta head over to Avid.com to see all that's new with Hollywood's most beloved NLE. Just take a look in those show notes and you will find a link to help with that. Okay, our editorial journey for the day has come to an end. If you're actually still listening, don't forget what I said about getting in those questions for the editing panel. I think it could be a lot of fun. And a nice little break for me with you asking the questions instead of me. I hope you take me up on that. But we'll see. Until next time, this is Matt Fury thanking you for joining me right here on The Rough Cut. Rough Cut.